thank you all again for, for spending time with us this afternoon. I think this is going to be really powerful. Uh, I know Jack and myself are both new board members for Minnesota Percussion Association. As we've been messaging back and forth, uh, we're going to be learning a lot. And I'm excited to hear from, from everyone in the, in the state and, and kind of see what's going on um, and, and be able to give some great information to students out there who are looking at the different college programs in the state and what it takes to be involved in those programs. But before we get started, uh, I have just a few reminders. Um, the first one is an important one is just a reminder that this session is being recorded. So that way those folks can watch this after the fact um, that aren't joining us today. Um, we'd like to thank our 2021 MPA sponsors. We've got Silver Sponsors, MarimboRental.com, Growth Music, the St. Cloud State University, Department of Music and Creative Costuming and Designs, the Bronze Sponsors, Shirtworks and Promotionals, Schmidt Music, and the Minnesota State University, Maverick Machine. Um, and and that's, that's all we've got for quick announcements and sponsors. Thank you to all of those for helping to make this, this season possible virtually in a pandemic as crazy as it's been. We were just talking before we uh, pressed record on this. It's just been wild. Um, and I don't know how you guys all feel right now, but for me, having it be basically a year from our, our last event, it just, it hit me yesterday. And today it's been ex exactly 365 days since my last hockey pet band event, which has just been crazy. So to get us started, I thought what we could do is just quickly go around and introduce ourselves, say maybe what school we're from, and maybe just give a short background on where you came from, what your, what your story is. So I'll start. Um, my name is Michael Thursby and I am currently teaching at Minnesota State University in Mankato. Uh, I'm from Iowa originally. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Iowa with Dan Moore and my master's degree at the University of Northern Iowa studying with Randy Hogan Camp and uh, kind of a cast full of folks because Randy took a sabbatical my second year in my master's degree. So I had three or four different people that I was working with there. I started out in teaching as a band director uh, in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. I taught there for three years and then this position opened up to start a marching band in Mankato and it just so happened they were also looking for somebody to do percussion. So it worked out for me. It's kind of a dream gig for me um, and I love it down here. It's, it's a lot of fun. Jack, why don't you go next since you are the other board member on here? Um, my name is Jack Donovan. Um, this is my first semester teaching at, uh, or for my first year rather, teaching at uh, Winona State University. Um, and then I just started teaching lessons at St. Mary's um, as well down in Winona. So it's been a it's been a good um, it's been a good first year for me. I mean, with all being said, you know, in the current situation, um, I've learned a lot so far and I'm excited to keep learning. And this is going to be a great opportunity for me to learn from all of you. Um, I got my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, where I studied with Jeff Kroll. And then I got my master's down at Kansas State University, where I studied with Kurt Gardner. Uh, while I was there, I was the drumline coordinator and arranger and all that. Um, so I got a lot of teaching experience doing that. Uh, and then I am working on my doctorates, working to finish up my doctorate with Fernando at the U of M. Uh, I think I'm a, two recitals and a paper away. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep the ball rolling, but you know, COVID's making it quite difficult for me. So um, yeah, that's, that's about, that's about it. So I'm excited. Great. Fernando, why don't you go? Okay. Um, my name is Fernando Meza and I teach at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Um, I am originally from Costa Rica, but I have been here since, well, for a long time. I first came to, uh, to study, spent a year in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon, then did my undergraduate degree at Baylor University in Texas and my master's at the University of Michigan. After that, I went back home for three seasons um, with the National Symphony of Costa Rica and started the program at the University of Costa Rica there. Uh, then after that, came back to the States, uh, got married. My wife is from Ohio, so we moved to Ohio. And um, as things might have it, you know, the position at Ohio State opened up that year. And um, I got that, that position after Jeff Moore retired. And then from Ohio State, um, uh, came here in 1993 to the, to the U of M. 
and it's, it hardly seems believable, but it's been that long, but uh, yeah, it's been 20, 20, 28 years now. And um, yeah, that's basically the, the background for me. Awesome, Terry. Yeah, um, so I grew up in Montana, I grew up in Missoula, Montana, the Rocky Mountains. Um, I kind of consider myself a mountain boy and um, did my graduate work at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, Colorado. Did my master's and my doctorate there. Um, been in St. Cloud State since 1990. So coming up in April, I'll get my 30 year medallion pin plaque thing. So very excited. It's been a great place to be. Um, love central Minnesota. Um, certainly enjoy working with MPA. Um, really enjoy sponsoring the group and love having finals up here um, when it's not COVID. And um, the organization is so great. I'm excited to see it move forward. Um, some of my best students have come from drumline backgrounds and they've participated in winter drumline activities. Um, so thanks for putting this all together. It's a blast to be here. David. Well, thank you to all you young people on the call here, making me feel really old. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody's quite there. So I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, grew up there and went to Peabody Conservatory when I was in high school. So I was in their prep program. Then I went to a small school called Frostburg State, which is in the armpit of Maryland, we call it, out on the, the western mountains. It's a small school, about 4,000. And from there, I went to the largest campus at that time, Fernando, which was Ohio State University, for my master's. And then uh, my doctorate was at LSU. And so I went from the kind of the far north to the deep south. Um, then did some other things. I was a band director, both, well, I did the reverse. I was high school band director because uh, did the music ed degree and then later performance and then I did middle school and then elementary school just found out that although I could do that I loved percussion too much so I just wanted to specialize in percussion and then moved up here to Fargo Moorhead so I'm currently at Concordia in Moorhead but I also taught at NDSU and Moorhead State that's what it used to be called before MSU the other MSUM uh, for 15 years and then uh, after doing two full-time loads basically Concordia said you know you need to change your lifestyle. So I went to Just Concordia. So we, we do a regular percussion ensemble, full group, and then we have a, a marimba ensemble. I call it the marimba choir. And then we have a gamelan that somebody else does in the West African ensemble. Uh, Jeff uh, Meyer, he's a theory um, history professor, but he spent several summers in, in Ghana, and we did several May seminars out there. So I really just do the percussion and marimba. I didn't know a lot about marimba, but thanks to Ohio State, you know, when I went there as a TA, uh, Jim Moore asked me to do the marimba ensemble or the two undergraduates. And of course, at Frostburg State, we had like two marimbas total. And uh, Ohio State, they weren't all great, but there was like a dozen marimbas. I'd never seen that many. I said, what is a marimba ensemble? And he had like four file cabinets full of just marimba music <laughs> for ensemble. So it's like, ah, pretty cool. Uh, so I did that. And then uh, we also had a faculty group, which was kind of neat too. Um, so Jim played, you know, marimba, and then there was a, a marimba that some, some of you younger people should know, Linda, Linda Pimentel was the doctoral student at that time. So you've probably learned, heard of Lee Stevens and Gordon Stout. Well, Linda was like on par with them at the time as far as U.S. marimbas go. And Jack Jenny, the composer. So the four of us kind of had one ensemble, and it was kind of really neat. Uh, so when I moved up here to Concordia, we actually had uh, two larger percussion ensemble, and some of the students wanted to do a special mallet group, just marimba. So I had copied a lot of music from Jim Moore. And of course, Concordia, you may not know, they have a pretty strong choral program. So like the first choir concert I went to, there's 1,500 people there. So when we formed this group, I thought, what should we call it? So I called it the Marimba Choir. And of course, there was people that would show up just because of the name choir. And uh, so we kind of educated them to marimba. Anyway, that's a little bit of history for me. Awesome. And last but not least, Henry, the newest one of the group, I think. Well, you and Jack. Yes, thank you. Um, great. So I'm uh, from Pennsylvania. Uh, did my uh, undergrad at Westchester University, uh, Ralph Sorrentino and Chris Hanning. Um, then I came out here, actually, did my master's here in Duluth with Gene Shinsky and Tim Brosius. Uh Graduated just a few years ago in 2018 and then uh, went to Michigan State for my doctorate. Um, and just like Jack, I'm in the same boat, uh, finishing up my degree this year uh, from MSU uh, in the midst of this crazy year. So it's been a little bit of a wild ride, but uh, 
all things are going all things are going pretty well but i'm glad to be back up here in the, the cold north um yeah i'm just excited to see where our, our, con our conversation goes today so thanks for having me all right well again thanks everybody um one of the first questions that popped into my mind and we have a couple of submissions and then Jack and I both had a couple questions too. But one of the first ones that popped into my mind that a lot of students have been asking is what is your current audition process? How has that evolved or changed in the pandemic with maybe limited access to instruments, um, not being able to get into a school, even, even play anything? Um, how have you kind of evolved that? I don't know if I wanna like call on anyone, but if anyone wants to just jump in and go first, that'd be awesome. Go ahead, Terry. Sure. You know, um, that's a that's a big realization we have is that students don't have access to a lot of the different instruments. So certainly for us at St. Cloud State, it's much more flexible than it's been in past. Um, drum set is normally an instrument that students would have at home. Um, they can probably still do a snare etude, but keyboard instruments and the other things. So we're just being much more flexible. Um, this year, uh, we went to an online system called Auditioned. And um, it's a portal that you can just upload videos and um, all your other information. So everything's going to be online um, with all of our auditions this year. You know, I'll jump. I'll jump in after Terry here. Um, yeah, I think I think the the key word probably for for all of us is going to be flexibility. You know, I think that we we you know there there's no choice. You know, we we have to be flexible with the process because there's basically no other way to do it. You cannot do things, you know, status quo uh, anymore because this, the, the pandemic simply does not allow for that. So for, for us at the U, the same, the same is true. We, we have done, and, and our additions are done for this year, you know, but um, it, was, it was entirely an online process. Um, and the, the suggestion, you know, that, that we gave those interested in auditioning, um, revolve primarily around the, the lack of access to timpani, which is what we found to be the most difficult instrument for students to have access to. Most, most everybody was able to have access, like Terry said, you know, to a snare drum because they either have a snare drum at home or have access to a snare drum somehow. And most of them would have a way to kind of sneak into their high school or, or, or somewhere to get access to a xylophone or a marimba or a set of vibes. But timpani, timpani proved to be more of an issue. And some, some students, of course, own their own mallet instruments too. But timpani certainly proved to be a, an issue. And, and so my, my kind of work around that was um, for students to do a little bit of singing of some intervals. I provided a, a sheet of, of some intervals for them to sing. And when it came to demonstrating some of the technical elements of timpani, it didn't really matter to me whether they played on a couple of drums, any any kind of drums, or even I told them, you know, if you if you don't even have access to two drums, then then go over and you know put some two cardboards on top of pillars or something, and just show me what you do technically, how your basic approach to playing timpani would be if those cardboards had sound or could produce sound, um, and then just sing through this various intervals, you know, get an A at the beginning, you don't get another reference pitch, just here's an A, sing from there the various intervals, and that's it. And so that constituted our, our timpani component of the audition. Uh, all the auditions that we received included um, a snare drum and a mallet performance on actual instruments, but several of the auditions um, re referred to the you know, suggestions of playing timpani on whatever medium some kids decided to play on two drums, or you know, there was you know, there was one student who played actually on two pillows, which was perfectly fine. You know, I could see whether or not they had the you know, the ability technically or the understanding technically through that. Um, and, and that was kind of the workaround for the time being. Fernando, that's kind of interesting because uh, I'm thinking back, we actually finished our auditions uh, in January and they had to submit their tapes online. And then we had another weekend, two weekends in February where we did interviews uh, with the students. So we've completed for the scholarship, the music scholarship. And we're still having students come to campus so they could actually audition in person, just have to be masked and uh, keep our physical distancing. But you know, several people did timpani. I think it's, we're right on the border here. Uh, North Dakota people have been more apt to go to school. They've been able to record a lot of things at their school. Minnesota students have had more of an issue, but it had more Minnesota students that actually had keyboards at home. 
So they might not be great, but two had xylophones. I think one had rented a marimba and one had a vibraphone. But the timpani part, I, one young lady actually did a timpani uh, three-drum etude on the dr her drum set. So they had put the four tom and two mounted toms and mounted on in a timpani fashion so I could see, you know, the pitches weren't correct. But it was interesting that, you know, she was really creative doing this timpani and wanted to play this, this solo. Uh, and then a couple have done uh, like complementary percussion. There was a tambourine solo, and uh, you know I have this little piece that one of my high school students did. It's for a triangle tambourine and castanets, which kind of you know showed that. But it it really probably the difficult part is timpani and the keyboard. Having a good keyboard, a lot of them were used to playing on a, at least a four and a half or five octave marimba, and just you know they said that they had played before the pandemic, but couldn't get into school to record something. But you could tell a lot from the, the interview process, and some people had taped something that they had done earlier uh, when they were in school. But it was, it was, it was quite an interesting process. process. David, can I ask, is that interview process something traditionally that you guys have done for auditions, or is that new with the pandemic? Well, they do it normally in person. So, you know, they would submit their tapes, and we would either watch or listen, and then we would invite the finalists to campus. So they would do the interview on campus. But we actually made more time, because when they come, they do their 15 minutes, and they would play an A2 or two. They're supposed to do two or three areas in percussion, you know, keyboard, snare, timpani or multiple percussion. And then we asked them questions after that. But this was nice that the 15 minutes entirely with our staff was with the person individually from their home. Um, of course, you know, with Zoom, you always have to be careful, you know, where you're at. And <laughs> so we saw interesting things and, you know, cats in the background and whatnot. But um, it, it was it was quite the pro it was long for the fact because we had two weekends and pretty much two full days, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. You know. Uh, it's like all the brass percussion did theirs, all woodwinds did theirs, and so we had about five or six faculty on each call. Jack or Henry, do you have anything to add? Anything maybe different that, that you guys are doing or pretty much the same? Um, I, th I think I, flexibility, I think, was key. I mean, I... I I was kind of in the interesting circumstance where it was like, here's what, you know, my predecessor Rich had for all his auditions. What do you want to change? I was like, I don't really want to change anything. That's great. You know, like, so then it's just kind of communicating with the students one-on-one -on -one about what do they have access to? What do they not have access to? Um, and I think like, obviously we've learned in this situation, communication is going to make everything somewhat easier. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, um, I think our process, again, is, is pretty much similar. Uh, students are just submitting everything on Google Drive and it goes into a folder and uh, comes in for all the instructors to review it. Um, but I thought it was helpful. One student was creative just because he didn't have access to anything other than his drum pad, pretty much. But I really appreciated his audition because he's a great snare drum player. So just from seeing him play on the drum pad was helpful. But he also, um, since he didn't have access to a keyboard or anything, submitted a number of things just to show me his uh, musicality. Um, there was an excerpt from a Winter Drumline show, so I could see that he played marimba um, pretty well. But also he included um, a Scott Joplin piano rag, which is like, oh, OK, you, you can play piano. That's very helpful to know. <laughs> uh, and he's a really, really talented pianist, too. So I know that at least translate. Um, it's not ideal. You know, it's not playing a xylophone rag, but uh, it was definitely helpful to see uh, his musical side. He also submitted um, just a, a couple other things that were just helpful in that respect of seeing his his musicality. So for me, that was really helpful to see. Um, and I thought that was a, a well-prepared audition uh, given what he had available to. Very cool. Jack, why don't you roll with your your question that you had? Yeah, I was gonna ask, what, what are you doing in your studio to make it a normal experience or at least a productive experience in your in your lessons and which we kind of spoke about earlier um but how are you how are you handling lessons studio class percussion ensemble differently um to get the most out of it with the current situation maybe i'll take that one first um you know it's 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 been interesting jack and in 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 certainly it's it's opened up some doors that that you know we perhaps would not have explored under under normal circumstances. Um, you know, in in years past, of course, you know we we are we have all experienced you know the the situation where we bring a guest in, you know, to to share in a performance and master classes and so on, and 
you know, that involves, of course, planning and money and hotels and travel and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, you know, you have one, two, three guests a year and, you know, and then life goes on and so on. Um, this this year opened, at least at least for us here and for me, you know, it, it really opened up a possibility of bringing a lot of people in um, via, you know, via Zoom. Um, so, you know, since the pandemic hit in, in, in you know, March of last year, um, as soon as as soon as we found out here at the U that that classes were indeed going to go all online, um, then I got, you know, I got on the email and I sent an email to a whole ton of colleagues around the world to see if they would be willing to, you know, to come in and spend, you know, an hour and a half with us during a studio class. Um, and since we were going to be completely online, that that was the studio class time and the both percussion ensemble times, which, you know, were, were kind of poofed, you know, in the in the air. And so I figured, you know, we just filled that, that space with with guests. And so I had, you know, three guests per week for the entire time from, you know, March through, you know, May or whatever it was last semester and or last year. And then um, this past semester, uh, we had, a, a, again, a bunch of people, but not doing percussion ensemble time because we went back to, to in person. So just the studio class, but we had a guest you know, and I'm and, and, and we're talking about people really truly from all over the world. And so that was very special for for my students to be able to connect with all these people, you know, superstars that, you know, heroes of everybody, you know, Theodore Milkov, Katarzyna Mitska, you know, Eric Samud and so on and so forth. Um, and, and people from different areas, you know, drummers in Broadway and and, you know, music, the, the, the music director of the University of Panama, Carlos Camacho, who is um, you know, a, a percussionist, former graduate of the um, Cincinnati Conservatory of Music, and now he's the music director of the university there. So administrators and anyway, so just just to show the students the, the different possibilities within the field of percussion, and so that was that was really unique in, in something I certainly would not have done, and you know, unless we were in, in, the, in the under the circumstances that we've been in. Um, but that that was certainly something that that was unique and that offered some some um, you know different perspectives for my students. Um, as far as the day to day, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. You know, just uh, we've been doing percussion ensemble now in person for two semesters, and and lessons we're doing online one week and um, in person one week. Uh, percussion literature and studio class are all completely online for us. So that's just you know a little. A little bit of the situation for us, at least here in the in the in the Twin Cities. I think some things have actually been easier to teach online. I, I hate to say that because it's very difficult, but like the literature class, I did that in the in the fall uh, because there's so many things to access. I mean, I have on my iTunes, you know, about 80 gigs, and I could pull up this tune that and, and show videos real fast. That normally in the class I would have a lot more you know, time to get that stuff ready. Uh, you know, we're pretty much in person now, you know, for everything since January. And uh, we actually were in person in the fall until Thanksgiving. So when we sent people home at Thanksgiving, they stayed there for the rest of the, the semester. So we did three weeks of online education. But our performances were recorded before then. It's been kind of difficult because of the, you know, the distancing. I tend to do a lot of larger ensemble pieces, um, you know, a lot of variety, but um, you know, I, I share marimbas, so you know, if I have 25 people, you know, I don't have 25 marimbas, uh, so I double up, and you know, uh, so it's been the distance thing. But I've gone to a lot of smaller ensembles, so I'll do still a couple larger works. But you know, we did like the Chavez Toccata that I wouldn't normally do. We've done a lot of quartets and you know, the, the Becker Away Without Leave, and things where students could be somewhat distanced, but to smaller ensembles where you know, you're trying to keep 20 people occupied throughout a couple hour rehearsal. Um, so it's been interesting, but I think what happened last spring, it was just when we were forced into the situation of, okay, everybody's going home, you're leaving campus. And I scattered for like two and a half days just to you know, grab as many tambourines as we had and triangles and music I copied and said, okay, go by the band room and pick up this stack and pick up this instrument and write down what you have. And so we did lessons online you know, with practice pads or snares that they had, and everybody did a tambourine solo and triangle excerpts, and we were doing things that they weren't normally, they, they would have done, you know, timpani or marimba if they were here, but we just kind of scattered. Uh, but it was kind of a, a learning process for all of us. You know, we actually, you know, MMEA just had their 
clinic and I submitted a tape from last year's performance. So we did a little 30 minute, you know, I was able to put eight tunes in there uh, of different on, ensembles and uh, everything from uh, quartets up to, I think I had 20 in the fall. But you know, I think for those couple weeks in the spring a year ago, we were just trying to figure out all this mess and how to make it work. And I think the students did real well, but it, it was different for all of us. I don't want to step on Terry's touchdown call, but for us in Mankato, it's been a lot of recording and editing and learning that process for our students and myself, honestly, some of the video projects that we've put together, I have learned so much technology that a year ago I wouldn't even have thought of. And it's it's been a blessing because we didn't really document so much of what we were doing. So we didn't have videos of the percussion ensemble. We didn't have as many videos of, of students performing solos. They would videotape them and then they would go off into a distance and we'd never see them again. So having that to look back on now from this year, uh, having something for the students to take away from this year, uh, that's a physical thing um, and learning how to do the recording process, learning how to mic uh, a marimba or a vibraphone, learning how to mic drums and what different mics you can use for different instruments and then how to go in and edit that and how, how that process works. And we learned the hard way. We tried a, a piece last spring where it was all clapping and we learned the hard way that that's way difficult to do and get it to line up virtually. Uh, it didn't come across maybe the way that we had hoped, but it, it was a long process of learning the recording and then learning the editing and all of our students in that process have learned a ton. Yeah, um, it was it was several years ago, actually, when I started thinking, you know, some of the best musicians I know uh, have a lot of experience recording studio musicians. Um, and the thing about that process of recording yourself, it closes that learning loop. You know, you, you get to practice and then you get to evaluate what you did because you listen to your recording and then you do it over again and you make continuous improvement with a nice closed learning loop. So when the pandemic hit, um, our practice rooms were already set up with, with uh, Macintosh computers, audio interfaces, microphones. They've got um, either Reason or Logic or GarageBand. And the students had already been making recordings. Um, so when the contemporary music ensemble, St. Cloud State, of course, is in central Minnesota and um, central Minnesota was quite a hotbed for a while um, for COVID. And so we made the decision back a year ago in March that we were gonna be totally online and we were gonna wait to see what happens this spring before we return to some face-to-face -face instruction. So my students were already well adept at recording themselves. And so with the Contemporary Music Ensemble, um, I'm making basically click tracks for the, for the students. And um, they take that click track and they play their part. They send me their part, I assemble it. So they're getting a lot of experience, um, you know, playing along with tracks. Um, and for us, that's been working really, really well. So they're either making a video or they're making an audio recording. We're just practicing remote recording. Um, we do part checks in Zoom. I listen to them play their parts. They play along with the metronome um, and we discuss style and articulation and, and um, all the different aspects as if we were face to face. Um, all the lessons have been online. Uh, it's been working very well. Um, like David, is, when you spoke about there, you can share a file immediately. You, you can share a link, an audio file, a document. Um, you can share your screen and check out the score and look at measure nine, check out this note here. Um, there's, there's quite a bit that can be done in Zoom very, very successfully. Um, there was a bit of a learning curve, like you talked about, Michael, about students had to know that they needed to get microphones that were good and they needed to learn how to do their Zoom settings. Um, but once we got past all of that, uh, I think the silver lining is kind of where I'm at, at right now with my students um, and the ensembles I'm working with. Just learning a different skill set that perhaps we wouldn't have been forced into before. 
you know, if I could, if I could add just one more thing, you know, and, and sorry, Henry, I, I, I may have cut into, into, into your time here, but um, I just, I just want to bring the students, kind of the students' perspective a little bit into this because usually, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, what am I doing? What do I do to, 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 to teach better for my students and so on? But this has also offered um, all of us an opportunity for the students to kind of take charge of some of their own projects and present and share with their peers. So that's also been a really nice um, outcome from all of this. You know, for example, during our studio class, which our studio class is a one time a week, you know, an hour and a half or so, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we get together and we talk about anything, you know, contemporary music notation, you know, rapping mallet, you know, making triangle clips, doing this, whatever, whatever it might be. But the students were actually very interested in, out of from their own uh, initiative that, that they should be presenting more. And um, of course, there's performances all during that time and so on. Uh, but they actually, you know, some of our music education students, and I have a couple of music therapy students also, um, they, they wanted to present on, on certain themes that were inter of interest to them. And, you know, so now they presented their PowerPoint and shared it with all their peers in the studio. And, and that has also been a really positive thing, I think, for, from all of this, not, not necessarily on the teaching side of things, but on the student initiative side of things as well. Yeah, I think um, I'm not in the same same boat over here up, up, up in Duluth, um, but I think we've actually been actually really fortunate um, because I've been able to do we've been able to do most of our stuff um, somewhat as normal, um, just spaced out. And uh, the the biggest concern I had at the beginning of the year was how the heck do we sanitize all this stuff <laughs> because we had a plan for a year in person and um, I had no idea how to tackle all that stuff like to a COVID safe. Um, you know, measure, but we, we sort of figured it out and it's okay now. Um, so yeah, I think we've been really fortunate up here in Duluth uh, because we have been able to do most things uh, as normal. We've had our percussion ensemble and uh, studio class uh, every week in person. We don't have a, a ton of students this year, so it hasn't been like, um, it felt pretty safe. Um, but I think, yeah, same deal with the recordings. Last semester, we were supposed to do a live streamed, no audience for concert, or, or, no audience performance um, and then like three days before everything got shut down for the rest of the semester so it was that was kind of a bummer um and i felt really bad because we had worked all semester and we were really looking forward to actually doing so some, somewhat of a performance but we were able to we were able to turn around and just record that repertoire at the start of this semester and now we're just recording for the semester to avoid that same thing happening again because <laughs> i didn't want to have to ruin that for anybody at the end of the year so um our department is also uh, it's in the works, but is putting together a department wide um, outdoor concert mini festival, not really a festival, but uh, there's uh, three weeks of concerts going on at the end of the year in, in April, weather permitting. Hopefully it's it's warm enough by then, but we're uh, there's, uh, I think, like nine blocks that ensembles were able to sign out a 15 minute slot to perform. And so it's not a full concert. Um, our percussion ensemble is going to play on one of those slots and everyone's really looking forward to actually doing some sort of live performance and it'll be outside. Hopefully it'll be nice and uh, really looking forward to <laughs> doing some live music again. So, yeah. That safety, cool. safety and sanitizing thing was an issue for us. And, you know, we just, I made a decision at the beginning of the semester last year that, you know, we just take all the covers off all the keyboards and we have a stack and, uh, I, I got these gloves, you know, deal these thin rubber gloves, like for methods class or when we're doing symbols and everybody comes up and plays symbols or the bass drum that, you know, if you want to use the rubber gloves and of course all the rooms have these little sanitizing stations out in front. So trying to be as safe as possible. And we looked into the uh, thing where you spray instruments and stuff and just said, no, we don't want to go to that route. That's a little bit too much. And then you have to wait a half hour before you play them. And, um, so just being as careful as possible, but you know we're, we're lucky. I mean, right now in the last two weeks, I think there's zero cases on campus for students, so that's good. You know, like three faculty, so they they've done a great job. We're all masked, of course, and keep our distance, but just things that they would normally touch in percussion, we're just trying to avoid that. You know, it's been good in a way for methods class because we sh used to share mallets, but I was able to get special permission to buy a set of marimba mallets for everybody in the class <laughs> so that they keep it for the semester and you don't have to share. So. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a year. 
Um, it looks like the two students who submitted questions are actually on the call. So instead of me asking their questions for them, I, I thought it might be kind of nice for them if they want to unmute and ask their question, that might be kind of fun. So Jacob, why don't you go first and ask the question that you submitted? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I'm considering, definitely considering doing music in college. I guess that's why I'm here but I'm not entirely sure what I want to major in. I've kind of flipped back and forth over the years between education or performance. So what are good ways to sort of hone in my interests and find out what I can commit to? I'll go first. I, I don't know, it, in Mankato, you, you don't have to commit to anything necessarily right away. Um, the programs that we have are set up initially, so there is a little bit of, I don't want to call it freedom, but there's a little ability to move between different majors in that if you come in, you're taking basic theory and you're taking some music history and things like that right away, where it, it gives you a chance to kind of find your path a little bit. And, and we have several students who come in and they think they're going to be music education majors and they switch or they think they're gonna be performance majors and they switch and that happens. It's, I've been here for eight years and it's happened almost every year that something like that has, has occurred. So you don't necessarily have to pick right away. And Jacob, yeah. I'll add, add to that, sorry. Uh, you know, Concordia, you can uh, you sign up for any major, but I probably have 50% of my students that switch uh, every year, you know, they'll come in and, you know, say, I'm going to do education. And after sitting through a class and well, you know, maybe performance, we also have a composition major. So, you know, you don't have to declare right away. The difference is the, the lessons for us, you know, if you're a performance major, it's an hour less than a week. If you're music ed, it's a half hour. So if you would switch into performance then you just have to add that extra half hour, you know, somewhere along the line, but students switch all the time. You know, I started as an ed major and I just found I'd like performance you know, later on, so by the time my junior year at Frostburg State, I could actually do both. So it was just another recital and another paper and a couple of classes. But, you know, knowing exactly what you're going to do for the rest of your life, hardly anybody can say this is going to be it. Um, Terry, uh, Terry, I don't know if you were going to say something, but um, one thing one thing that I think is unique maybe within the music field is is there's – the core, the core classes that all of the majors have to take between music ed, music performance, composition, theory, you know, you all have, everybody has to take these three or four theory classes, these three or four history classes and stuff like that. So everybody for the first kind of couple of years, and it probably varies from school to school, um, everybody's kind of in the same little cohort, regardless of major. So there, there is definitely some time to, to figure it out, for sure. Yeah, same at St. Cloud State. Um, we we designed our fall semester. Um, you don't start theory, music theory, and musicianship until spring semester. So fall semester is largely uh, liberal education courses, private lessons, ensembles, and it gives you a chance to mix with that cohort that Jack was talking about and talk to them about uh, careers in music education. And so you you have time to figure it out. Yeah, I think I think you're gonna find that. You know, anywhere, any, everywhere, pretty much, Jacob. Um, you, you, you have, you have time. You know, once you arrive at a school, you don't have to, you know, put it in stone that you're gonna do this only. You know, there's, there's time. There, there is time to figure it out. You know, um, you know, it, it, it might very well be that you decide to double major in both music ed and performance instead of just doing one or the other, um, which is, you know, it has been. Um, a thing over here also at the University of Minnesota that, it, you know, I, I have students who are double double majoring, even in fields that are not in music, you know, I have double majors who are pursuing, you know, computer science or, or, you know, finance or, you know, engineering or whatever it might be. Um, and, and some amazing musicians, you know, I have a kid right now who's a computer science major, who's just a fabulous, you know, marimbist and, um, you know, just just finished doing um, this arrangement of Rhapsody in Blue by Adelaide Ferrer, um, this French fabulous young marimbas, did a beautiful arrangement of, of Rhapsody in Blue. But this kid just finished working on that. And this is a, you know, 30, 30 page composition. And, and he's a computer scientist, you know, he's not even a music major. 
So uh, it is it is possible to do all of those things too, even if it, if it's not just within music, you know, but as a double as a double major too. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too. Um, similar things here. Um, I think a lot of schools probably have this as well. But I know one of the popular degrees here at UMD is the music BA, where um, you have the option to combine it with another major. Um, so same sort of deal. Uh, actually, most of my students right now are music BA students. So one of them is uh, music and biology. Another one's I think a chemistry minor. Um, so that's an option always. And like from personal experience, I came in um, when I was an undergraduate. Came in thinking I was going to be a band director. I think like a lot of the high school students, um, and did not <laughs> end up going down that path at all. Well, uh, it's still educating, but um, there's always just like everyone has said, just echoing it again. I guess. Uh, there's always time to learn more as you're going through college and figure out where you want to go. That's part of the beautiful part of doing a music major in college. Is just learn um, as much about the field as you can, and then you can kind of go from there. So I don't think you have to be um, super set in stone right away. And there's always room to, to grow even a, a year or two in the, into the degree. So one, one more thought I have, and I certainly don't want to don't want to. Um, encourage you to or discourage you from studying music that is not at all what I mean by this but there one thing that's beautiful about music is there's so many people who participate who they they're majoring in something else entirely and they're not not a music major not a music minor but they play in band they take lessons they play in percussion ensemble and stuff like that and sometimes those are the people who enjoy it the most you know I've, I've noticed you know they're there for the right reasons you know <laughs> You know, there's one thing that I've found that's been successful here. You know, like Fernando, we have a percussion master class every other week. We get together for an hour and 15 minutes. But what we do is, I've done this for quite a while, we have percussion buddies. So every semester I team up an older person and a younger person. And so the freshmen learn a lot from the juniors or seniors that have been around. And some are majors and some are non-majors. Because all of our scholarship students have to take lessons and play in an ensemble. So, you know, they're supposed to get together, you know, once a week for a half hour, usually go get a cup of coffee or something. And a lot of students learn a lot of things from the upperclassmen. And every semester you have a different buddy. So you get your chance to ask a lot of questions. Sometimes younger students are a little apprehensive about asking us older people, professors, you know, questions. So, you know, when it's one of your own, you feel more comfortable. Awesome. Sierra, you had a question for us. I did. So my brother is a music ed major at Winona. So I kind of know a little bit, but like that's kind of mostly the reason, like, I guess I'm just able to know some stuff about it, but I also like didn't, I don't want to be really a teacher necessarily. And I just kind of wanted to know like how I, I joined late. So maybe you talked about this already and I didn't hear it, but like, I guess I just kind of want to know like how the music composition major works and like how it differs from music education. Uh, we have a we have a Bachelor of Arts degree with an emphasis in composition. Um, what we do at St. Cloud State, we have a lot of um, electronic music, a lot of digital composition. Um, a music major is going uh, is going to study the same core classes. A composition student is still going to take all the theory classes, history classes, take private lessons, going to be in ensembles, um, kind of the core music classes. But of course, they're going to be studying composition um, one on one with the composition professor, um, and they're going to be presenting composition recitals, um, their works. So they will get their works performed. Um, our contemporary music ensemble at St. Cloud State serves as the ensemble for student composers. So um, we're always getting scores every semester and we're always putting those performances um, to the stage. I think the, um, oh, sorry for, oh, go ahead. No, no, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I actually, I can, I considered the uh, the composition track during my undergrad as well. Um, and and from what I remember it being, and I'm not sure what it's like school to school, but um, I, I I remember it being somewhat aligned with the theory program as well, taking taking a couple more theory classes and stuff like that to kind of really understand what's going into the music you're putting out, whether it's related to that or not nowadays, you know. Um, and and I found a lot of a lot of programs um, 
maybe require a little more, um, not only lessons on your primary instrument and composition lessons, but also keyboard lessons as well, taking piano and things like that. Uh, because a lot of times the teachers want writing at the piano, writing in a piano score, and then um, orchestrating that to a larger score. Actually, what, what I was going to say here is that we actually do not offer an, an undergraduate degree in composition at the U of M. Um, it's only, only a master's uh, program, but um, you know, I have, I have students who, of course, are also interested in composition. And, you know, there, there's always a way, I think, you know, like the saying says, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, I, have, I have a student who just got a, a piece published by C. Allen Publications, and um, it's a beautiful marimba piano composition, and, and she's just written another piece for the percussion ensemble. You know, I have a student right now who's uh, is going to be orchestrating a, a silent film uh, for the percussion ensemble. Um, so, you know, the, the interest on the part of students for composition is, is certainly there and, and students find a way to bring those, to bring those projects to fruition somehow. Um, like I said, we, we don't offer it as a degree, but like Jack was saying, you know, it's, it, those, those students who are really interested in composition kind of go more towards the theory track of things and, and kind of go from there. And eventually, you know, for the master's program, you know, they, they do pursue it here, but uh, not at the undergraduate level. We don't offer it here. So, so at Concordia, we do have a composition major for undergraduates, and you do an hour lesson a week. We have three actually faculty that are composition, but you know, there's probably at least ten of us that also compose. So if it's a percussionist, uh, you know, I've done a fair amount of uh, compositions, and uh, you know, they'll study with the composition faculty plus take lessons on their private instrument. But the rest of the classes, the theory and the history, are the same. So whether you're ed or performance or composition, you're in the same classes, you just have that extra lesson. And we do have the same the chamber ensembles where they premiere works. I think there's two composition recitals every semester that we have. I think one, one other thing here, Sierra, that might inform you, you know, as far as different programs out there is that one of the really fabulous things about about music and the music environment in college is that you are going to be surrounded by a lot of people that have your same interests, you know, and, and, and peers that are all going to be, you know, chomping at the bit to get music created, music performed, or, and, 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 and you're going to find people around you that you can, you know, put together, create an ensemble, experiment, try things out, write music for, perform, etc. So, um, I think I think that's one of the that's that's one of the amazing things about what we do. Really, I remember you know my own experiences as a student, and and things that may not have been on the on the offerings in terms of the class offerings. I always found ways to 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 do them. You know, for example, you know I was when I was in undergraduate school, I became very interested in in North Indian tabla drumming, but that was nowhere to be found in the in the you know plan of studies uh, for the school. So I found, you know, a friend of mine who who um, played flute, but who was also a sitar player, and um, and he also had quite a bit of knowledge about tabla, and so we got together, and that created, you know, some interest on the part of a couple of other colleagues, uh, a violinist who was really more of a fiddle player. This was in Texas, so he was a really good fiddler, and and then another guy who was a bass player, and um, you know that generated interest for us as performers, and then in turn, it generated interest on the part of composers or people who were interested in composition who decided to, they would write some things for us. And so, like I said, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. You're always gonna find opportunities to create and do and do what you wanna do, because there's gonna be a lot of people around you that are gonna have those interests as well. It'd be interesting, Sierra, what kind of things do you write? What kind of things have you written? What's What's your thing is a budding composer um well i my first instrument was piano so like when i was like 10 or something i made this like little like one four five piano song and then from there i kind of made like more piano stuff and then i got finale one time for christmas and i tried making i tried just like messing around on there and it's like um i didn't have much experience with like balancing like the sounds of an orchestra but i was able to kind of write a little like symphony thing 
but it it wasn't that good. And then now I kind of write uh, more kind of like electronic ambient type of stuff on Ableton because I only have the basic like samples and I don't have any like classical samples or anything. So I've just been working with the synths and I'm still like trying to write piano stuff. It's just a little harder. I'm kind of at like a block right now, but I mostly write like piano and I would love to like learn how to better write orchestral stuff. Cool. Just remember, um, just write every day. Don't judge it. Just write. Just write two measures and then put it away and come back to it later. And it's just like a literary writer. If you're not writing every day, you're really not writing. So don't don't judge it. Just do it. Are... That's excellent advice right there, Sierra. <laughs> just yep. going to say the same Save thing. It. Don't throw it away. Save it. That's great. Because <laughs> you never know. You might use it later. That actually, that actually was something that I just experienced a couple weeks ago. Um, I... A, a, before that, a month or so before that, I was working on a movement for the Grove Area Percussion, the drumline, the winter drumline I work with. And I was like, I wasn't happy with it. I just, I closed the program, didn't delete it, thank God. And then I came back to it two weeks later. I was like, oh, this isn't bad. And it ended up working. And now we're, we're learning it on the floor right now. So that's, 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 it's proof in the pudding for sure. <laughs> My first snare drum book, I started in high school and I wrote a couple etudes and put it away. And I started in college and my first publication and i'm like a freshman and like wow they want to publish my works but it was like three years of of etudes that i put together so you never know these are are great questions too so thank you jacob and sierra um sam i i want to give you a chance if you've got a question to jump on if you if you want to can you hear me mm -hmm. everybody okay i've had issues with the microphone on this computer for some reason but uh, hi, my name is Sam Peck. Um, I'm actually currently a college student at St. Thomas, uh, although it's for communications and journalism. And I also direct River City Rhythms indoor drumline. So I wanted to see what you guys had to say about the um, the online teaching and education and stuff, because that's basically all the resources we've been able to have this winter. We haven't really had the ability to meet in person anywhere um, because we're an independent organization. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what do you guys do to really maintain like a level of engagement and motivation with your students as you go through um, the online lessons and other things that you guys do that isn't in person? Um, yeah, I'm just curious what you guys have to say about that. Yeah, you know, one thing um, that that I read about and I've begun doing this spring semester is having students submit videos throughout the week while they're practicing. So one of the difficulties of an online situation is accountability and motivation. And so I, I say to my students, three days before your lesson, I need to have a short video of you playing this excerpt from this piece. And then the day before your lesson, I need another video. So while they're practicing, they just let their camera roll, whatever their phone camera, and they send me a video. Um, and that helps keep engaged um, when they're not around you all the time. I think one of the hardest things for me has been that sense of community that we experience in ensembles in person when we're when we're together. Um, you know, I think to the pet band in Mankato, for example, because working with that group, a lot of what we do is being at events, is being at a hockey game and, and experiencing that atmosphere. And that's where those bonds are formed between students. So it's been kind of a challenge over Zoom to have, you know, for my incoming percussion majors who normally we would have a potluck and we would get together and we would do those things. We we try we've tried to get creative over Zoom and do different get to know you type activities and and do that as much as possible. And then when the weather's nice enough, you know, Henry, you probably have dealt with your fair share of snow already this year, but when the weather's nice enough, doing things outside in a park, um, you know, our, our drummers last Thursday, we had our, our final drumline rehearsal before break. And I said to them, would you rather drum outside or be in subsections? 
and most of them said they would rather drum outside even though it was still a little bit chilly they wanted to drum outside because they could all be together and we could we could spread out a little bit more but they could all be in the same outdoor space so that that sense of community and coming together I, that's been that's been the biggest challenge for me is trying to figure out different ways to make all of the students um, connect like they would in a normal time even though we're all connected through the internet right now, it's not the same. I think I feel probably more blessed than a lot of people I hear because we have been able to be in person, uh, you know, somewhat different. But, you know, last spring was just so here it is, you know, like a year ago and it, we're done. Uh, and we tried, you know, last March and April to do some online playing together, even if it was practice pads and tambourines. And it just doesn't work over Zoom. <laughs> and um, so we you know, wound up, you know, everybody muting except one person. And we'd all play and listen to, to one. It's just, and, I, and I remember in the fall, you know, we got together back in, in September because last spring we were two weeks away from our performance. As you know, most of us probably were. We had our big day of percussion uh, planned and it was you know, going to be April 1st. And we had Gordon Stout and uh, Adam Mason and people you know, coming in. So we had been apart you know, for several months and all of a sudden uh, I figured, well, after our brief talk and get everybody together, we had about 22. Let's pull out every marimba and keyboard we had. So we just got together and did uh, had an arrangement of Evelyn Glennie's Little Prayer. So we just kind of started this keyboard. <clears throat> you know, we had people kind of crying because we hadn't been together in, you know, five, six months playing. And wow, we're all together as a community, as, as you mentioned. It was just, you know, terrific to actually play. I don't know how many PAS members there are, but I was really impressed uh, this year's convention. The Cavaliers did an online presentation, and it was just super. I know it was a lot of work, but how they actually did that and just the editing that went into that performance, I, I watched it several times because it was just amazing for that hour plus of putting that video together. So I think, again, technology is we can learn better how to do those things. It's nothing like being in person and having that sense of com community, but... It was great to see what they did. I was very impressed. You know, um, Sam, one of the uh, one of the things that, that we did here, you know, and, and certainly, you know, I mean, I think we all are, are keenly aware, you know, that the sense of community, as, as Michael was, was talking about and, and everybody, is, is the one thing that we have all been affected by in a, in a really difficult way. Because music, of course, is all about communication, you know, and we communicate through it, we exchange, you know, ourselves through it. And, and it's obviously a very, very special way of, of establishing connections amongst people. And, and to all of a sudden have that kind of yanked away from us, it has, it has certainly affected all of us, you know, both of us uh, as teachers as, as, as much as the students. Um, you know, one, one of the projects that we did, and this is just a little example of, of you know, how we have all had tried had had to have had to find ways to to be creative about about having some kind of connection um we we did a project um you know uh, several months ago that it was a it was actually an international project you know being being originally from costa rica i have a lot of friends over there that the the two percussion professors at the university of costa rica are, happen to be former students of mine and we're very very good friends and um, we decided we would do a, a, a joint collaboration online. And at that time, you know, I, it was kind of on the, on the onset of, 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 of the pandemic. And, you know, some students had some instruments, some students, most students didn't have access to them and so on and so forth. So I thought that maybe a way to do this would be to just create an improvisation with whatever it was that we might have at home. You know, so I suggested let's go in the kitchen and find things, you know, and all of us do it a project with kitchen utensils. So that was the, the, the birth of the idea that evolved. And then the students got very excited about the, the possibility. And one of my students decided she would write a composition for everybody to anchor um, onto, you know, to, to grab onto so that everybody could play along the same lines of a piece of music. So she had a click track, she wrote the, the tune and she sent everybody the music and, uh, and people played with whatever it was that they had. The idea would be was that we would do it mostly with with homemade utensils but people had you know marimbas at home some of them some had a guitar some had you know whatever it was and uh we ended up doing this this project it was actually a very cool thing um so 
you know, this this has opened up opened up doors that we don't normally walk through. But as as creative individuals that all of us are, somehow we're going to find ways to, you know, to create a new path out there. So I would say, you know, anything, anything that you anything that you can think of that is kind of outside the box, because we are all thinking outside the box right now you know, to make to make this time work. Uh, but anything that you are thinking of that you might be able to implement with some of your peers or students, um, you know, give it a shot. It might turn out to be a really, really cool, cool project for you guys. Sam, I don't know if you're looking for um, like practical activities to do in Zoom in the online environment. Um, I don't know what kind of things you might already be doing with the group, but um, I've put in the chat window a number of documents. Um, you know, we find it really fun to just get together and work together. And I know Zoom, you can only hear one person at a time, but you can take turns who's going to lead certain exercises. So um, we've been working the four mallet floor party in an online environment. Everybody sits down and, and takes turns. I'm going to lead this one. I'm going to lead that one. They unmute, you know, um, same thing with the 40 rudiments in four minutes, 33 seconds, along with the click track. Um, you know, so just getting together in an online environment, padding out for a while, chopping out for a while um, is a great way to create community, which is what Michael was talking about and Fernando's talking about. Um, and you just have to accept the fact that you really can't do a lot with Zoom, you know. What kind of things are you doing, Sam? I mean, what kind of things is the group trying to make happen? Uh, well, coming into this year, we are obviously hoping to get into the competitive circuit a little bit, but being unable to congregate and record videos for the competitions is not possible for us at this time. So we've really decided to focus on the education. And what we've done is created a 16 week season where they are offered a lesson every other week. And that kind of gets rolled into their very small amount of dues and they get those lessons one-on-one -on -one throughout the year. And then every Friday night we meet as an ensemble We'll have two different Zoom chats, one for the front lines, so like the keyboards and such, and then one for the batteries, so like snares, bass drums, and that. And what we've been doing is working on a couple of etudes. Like for the battery, we, we arranged a tune from uh, a drum set player named Benny Greb called Tricky. Um, and so we wrote battery parts to that, and they're playing with the track so that they have that music to play along to. So like we do the same thing where like they have to be muted when they play, but we'll have like either a time source, like a metronome playing through uh, whatever instructor's speakers, or they'll be playing it themselves and they can play along with that on their own. Um, and then the front line, they're playing a, a cover of a Jacob Collier piece, but the name of it is escaping me right now. Um, and then we're also doing another full project. Uh, RCR has a winter guard and a winter horn line or winds program as well. And so the three ensembles are all working on one piece together. So like we're, we're offering unique tunes and um, and like pieces of music, etudes for them to work on. Again, it's just the trick of not meeting in person ever because we can't do that. Uh, like a couple of my students are actually also uh, Michael's students as well down in Mankato. And I've had at length conversations with a couple of them about like how much they love what you know we've been doing and stuff, but just that lack of camaraderie and only doing the online thing. Well, not the lack of camaraderie, I guess that you know, just the inability to meet in person is kind of inhibiting their overall experience. So, I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of things you guys are suggesting already. Um, so that it makes me feel good that uh, individuals such as yourself are saying like, you should do these things. I'm like, okay, good. Like I'm, I'm doing some of that already. Um, but yeah, just maintain the online thing um, has definitely been tricky for us and maintaining engagement through not meeting in person is, just challenging. So, Sam, take take heart in the fact that, as as the saying goes, this too shall pass. You know. Yeah. Yep. The, and and we are all, I think, beginning to see a little bit of the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I think you know the we have been under this this cloud, you know, for so long, and and now whenever there's a light shining, no matter how small that light might be, you know. We are all giddy about it because it's like, hey, things are going to change somehow. 
And I think I, at, at least that's how I feel. That's how my students feel. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely feel, you know, much more giddy than I've felt in many months because it's there is light at the end of the tunnel somehow, you know. And so, you know, we, we all need to take heart in that, you know, and and uh, when that time comes, of course, when we can all get back in the rehearsal space and actually play, you know, after Stuba, you know, with three people, and one marimba, you know, <laughs> or whatever it's going to be. We're all we're all going to be jumping on the marimba with joy, you know, but but this too shall pass. And I think we're 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 coming into that space where where things are, are beginning to, to to get better. So, you know, I'm certainly uh, expecting that, you know, in in in, I don't know, six months, eight months, a year's time. Um, life will be very will look very different and, and we'll be all all the happier for it, too. So hopefully by next season. And then for for you guys, especially uh, next fall, so that you guys can have normal classes again to teach. So, yeah, I, I definitely see that light too. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to like seem negative or anything. It's just we're obviously all experiencing yeah. these unique oh, no. challenges together, and um, yeah. So, yeah, I I love the light at the end of the tunnel thing. Yeah, um, and, and part of any situation, of course, uh, when when it's a, a tragedy, is acceptance. One of the steps is that helps me a lot is I just accept the fact that nothing's going to be perfect and, and nothing's going to be the way we want it. So let's just make the best of what we can do. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, without having this be too long, because I, you know, if, if students want to go back and watch this, making sure that they sit and they watch the entire conversation of being longer than an hour is a lot of time, but I, I do want to uh, kind of wrap this up just just a little bit. And the, the last question that I had, and it's not really a question um, or a sales pitch. This isn't a recruiting video specifically for our different programs. But one of the things that I remember from when I was teaching in Grand Rapids, even before I started in Mankato, was in, in looking at the different college programs in our region. One of the things that I love is that we all offer a lot but we also have things that are very different about each of our programs. And I love that because it gives students a ton of variety that they can, they can look at the different programs and they can make a really cool choice of where they'd like to go. And, and I thought this would be a good opportunity in kind of wrapping this up for maybe for each of us to share just a couple of things about our program. So as if students are watching this and they're coming back, they can look at this video and they could say, okay, well, this is what is happening in Mankato. And this is what's happening at Winona. This is what's happening in all the different places. And, and a lot of it might overlap and that's okay because the programs overlap and that's why it's nice to have the differences in the programs. But I thought that might be kind of a nice way for us to wrap this up. So does anybody wanna go first on that last bit? I'll just get it out of the way, right? So, um, you know, like I said about, um, I began focusing my curriculum on um, allowing students creative spaces and creative places. Um, so yes, you're gonna study marimba. Yes, you're gonna study timpani. You're gonna study concert percussion, classic percussion, orchestra percussion. Drum set is one of my big backgrounds, um, jazz studies. But when I designed our practice rooms, we have five percussion practice rooms at St. Cloud State. Each one of them is set up to be a creative space. And so I wanna make sure that all of my students are able to create artifacts that can document their progress, but they can also take with them post-graduation. So whether they're making recordings or videos, um, they're able to create those artifacts because I've designed these creative spaces. Um, and that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. Well, I'll go next. Uh, I, not that it's a time issue. I do have a 430 lesson coming up. So <laughs> at Concordia, we have, you know, the, it's a music education school. So basically, the majority of our majors are music ed. I mean, it's a fair amount of performance and a few composition. But we have three concert bands. And there's an athletic band that plays at the games when you're able to do that. And we have two orchestras, three jazz ensembles, and I tried to get as many opportunities in percussion. So earlier I mentioned, you know, we have our regular percussion ensemble, which 
everybody that's a major and scholarship students are part of. And it ranges somewhere between 18 and 25, 26 people. And then this year we're doing smaller ensembles. We have the separate mallet ensemble that called the Marimba Choir. And the gamelan was something that we added about 10 years ago. Just happened to be great uh, opportunity for us to get that. Somebody else uh, runs that as our West African group. It's really almost too many opportunities for students, but they're not in all those ensembles at once. Most of the students are in one of the major uh, performing ensembles, the band or orchestra, and then percussion ensemble, and the jazz people that are good drum set players, they'll do jazz, and the ones that will do mallets will do marimba choir. Uh, and I do have, you know, it's an undergraduate school, so you're here hopefully for four years. You know, we have a guarantee, you know, four-year program, as long as you pass your courses, that uh, you will graduate in four years. Uh, so I have eight semesters lined out that, you know, we usually do two instruments a semester. You know, it's like we'll do marimba and snare, and then we'll do vibraphone, and um, you know, timpani is pretty much timpani this semester. We'll do uh, xylophone, both ragtime and orchestral excerpts, and we'll do multiple percussion, which is always an interesting area, and getting ready for senior recital. So it's kind of laid out there that you, you do several instruments. And I changed that over the years when I uh, went and was a TA at various schools. I know Jim Moore at Ohio State, you did one instrument a quarter. So that it's not overloaded, because when I was undergrad, you know, one week was snare drum, the next week maybe timpani, and then, oh, let's do mallets this week. Well, we haven't done, you know, xylophone for whatever. So it was almost too much, and I didn't know what I should be practicing for the next week. So that's when I limited, you know, what I do per semester. Uh, I'll hop in next. Uh... Winona is kind of a it's it's a small town and it's a small um, it's a small program as well. So there's plenty. Well, with that said, I still think there's a lot of opportunity within the program and and even within the community. There's a lot of great venues for if you're playing in uh, if you have a band you want to go gig at the at the brewery or at whatever venue. There's there seems to be a lot of a lot of that going on, and I think that's a great opportunity for a lot of um, a lot of students at the undergrad level. You know, for well, for for us at, at the at the U here uh, in Minneapolis, it's you know, I mean, obviously Minneapolis is a fairly large city, and there's a lot of activity, you know, in the in the Twin Cities. Um, so there's there's no shortage of you know of activities that the students can be engaged with. I mean, certainly not during this COVID time, but during regular times, you know, outside of the school, but within the within the school. Uh, the U is obviously a you know a, a comprehensive school of music, so you know there's there's the offerings of you know of, of really high quality band program, you know high quality orchestra program, um, you know and the, and of course all the activities within the percussion studio. Um, it's you know there, like David was saying, you know there's there's it's almost like too many things for for people to to engage in, you know steel band ensemble and you know uh, organis you know different different um ensembles that i may not necessarily be uh i mean they're somewhat part of the university but not somewhat like our, our gamelan ensembles kind of connected with the u through joko sutrisno but not quite and so there's a lot of community people but also university students um you know so Mensa who comes to to teach the african music ensemble you know um so of course it's a huge program at McAllister college uh which is you know over in saint paul and and, and, and it's a gigantic program over there. It's not as big as the, at the U here because it's here only one semester a year. Uh, we're trying to make that too. But um, so there's there's different options, you know, for the percussion students, you know, in, in within the percussion ensemble and everything. But um, being a being a comprehensive school of music, of course, there's a lot there's a lot of really you know great opportunities for for people. But um, the the one thing that I was going to say is that we really are uh, very blessed in the in the state of Minnesota. You know, in in having all the all the wonderful programs that we have. You know, David has an incredible thing going out in the Fargo area. You know, in Terry at St. Cloud, and and so on and so forth. You know, and 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 each one of us, of course, has a has a unique approach to what we do. You know, and our schools have unique unique perspectives and unique uh, abilities to offer. You know, X, Y, and Z for our students. You know, not every school is the same, and and luckily they're not the same. You know, because everybody has. Has has unique things that the students can can take from those programs. So, uh, for for anybody who's who's looking for a program for majoring in in percussion or or participating in percussion, perhaps not even as a major, you know, they can look at this program or this program or this program, and they're gonna find 
that that one of them is gonna is gonna suit their needs. So um, that's that's really a, a beautiful thing about about percussion in our state that there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of schools. You know, we have a lot of really really great programs in our in our in our schools in our colleges. You know, and I mean, there's a lot of you know small colleges like McAllister College, for example. You know, if you wanted to participate in an African music ensemble, you know, McAllister College is a fabulous thing, you know, and they have a great program. So if that's your thing, you know, perhaps that's where you want to go, you know, or, you know, what, whatever may be your interest, there's definitely something out there for you. It just all depends what, what the students' passions and interests and desires are to, to pursue their study of percussion. There's bound to be a program out there for sure for you in the state. Yeah, all really good points um, made about just like lots of variety going on here and we share a lot of uh, commonalities here at UMD. Um, I think one cool thing about uh, going to school here and, and being up in Duluth is just, it, it's got sort of a, a larger school vibe, but it's a very small program. So you get um, opportunities that maybe a larger uh, program might offer, but it's, it's pretty intimate atmosphere. So you get to know everyone very well. Um, and get to play in a bunch of ensembles if you want to do that or if you don't need to go down that route you can do that too so there's a lot for you to do um, as a percussion major um you know we've got uh, a couple different bands uh one ensemble concert band that you can play in if you're a major or not uh non-majors are really involved in our music department as well so if you're somebody that's watching this and you're not even don't decide to do a music major i've got uh, half of my students right now are uh, my private lesson students are not majors just wanted to take drum set lessons or um, working on stuff because they want to audition for the drum line next year or something like that. Um, and I know a lot of majors will or non majors will play in our concert band or even our percussion ensemble, our hand drum ensemble. Um, so there's uh, lots of stuff for anybody, no matter what sort of path you pursue. Um, so I think that's one of the cool parts about the program here. So it's, it's pretty active across the board, no matter what you're doing. Yeah, I just want to echo what Fernando said one more time. And I just, I love how much there is in Minnesota. There's so much that we have to offer between all of us on this call. And there are so many more that aren't on this call who could be on this call very easily that we, we just have a lot and it's, it's incredible. Um, in Mankato, one of the things that I, I really enjoy about our program and it's unique is that our largest major is actually music industry. It's not music education, it's not performance, it's music industry, and it's the recording side of thing, which I've learned a lot from my colleagues this past year and, and how to, to do that. Um, but we have a lot of students who come in and, you know, drum set players who can't read music and they, they just play drum set and they want to get a music major and they start that way and it starts with the music industry major. Um, and the other thing for me that that I just love doing is drumline. And I, I know it, it goes back to my high school days and then marching drum corps and doing what I've done in drum corps and being involved now with MPA as a board member. Drumline's a big part of who I am and who our program is. And and that's, that's kind of cool. And I like that. Um, I think one of the other things that you'll find in, in trying to find that right college place is looking at who you potentially would study with. Um, I, I think that all of us would say that you have a pretty cl close relationship with those students who come in. And as a student looking at a college, getting to know who you might be studying with is a good idea too, because all of us are gonna be a little bit different and, and that's what's awesome. You know, we all have our own different personalities and each of the programs have their own quirks. And that's, that's a great, great thing. Um, I know that communication is, is huge. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of the faculty members who are on this call or, or anyone who isn't on this call. Um, most of the faculty members will get back to you and, and they'll be able to answer questions. And, you know, again, with Zoom, you can set up a Zoom meeting now and, and you don't have to travel to wherever that school is and it just makes life so easy. So that's, that's all I had. Um, I, I think this is a great way to, to wrap things up. And, and again, I, I appreciate um, my colleagues for joining us today. And those of you that asked questions, they were wonderful questions. So thank you so much, everybody. Again, enjoy the weather. Tomorrow's supposed to be almost 70 degrees down here in Mankato. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome. That's great. Thank you, Michael and Jack and everybody else for organizing this. And 
certainly it's nice to see all my good friends and colleagues out there, David, Terry, Jack, it's nice seeing you too. And, uh, you know, after a while of not seeing you at school here. Uh, I miss yeah. it. I really do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for putting it together. I can say one more, one last comment. The young people in Minnesota, you're so blessed these days because when I came here, <clears throat> it was like a century ago, actually it was last century, you know, 35 years ago, there was two full-time percussion teachers in the state of Minnesota. That's it, two. <laughs> and now look at this, and there's more people that aren't in this call of teaching, and uh, the opportunities that you have are just great. But that connection, why I went to the schools in the far south and the Midwest was because of the teacher. One I never thought I'd go to, and all of a sudden I met this teacher, and it was like, wow, this mm -hmm. is the place I want to be. So. And, and I, I wanted to echo all of that. I just wanted to say my personal thanks uh, to Vlad and Sam for the teaching you're doing um, with all those young musicians. And uh, you're doing great work. MPA is just such a solid organization. And we're really fortunate to have it here in Minnesota. So thanks for everything you're doing. Yeah, you too. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your afternoon. And, and thanks for joining us today.